Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Lynette Clementson, Director of Wallace House and the Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists here at the University of Michigan. I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon for today's important Policy Talks event, which is co-sponsored by the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, Wallace House, and the Donia Human Rights Center here at the university. Dean Michael Barr of the Ford School serves on the board of Wallace House, and we very much appreciate and enjoy these collaborations between Wallace House and the Ford School. Before we dive into this discussion today, a couple of quick notes about our format. We will be in conversation with our guests for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, um, both of which we will have received from registration and also from live feeds on Facebook and YouTube. Um, you can send questions using the chat feature on YouTube or on Facebook, or you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag policy talks. So now let's get started. I'm very happy to welcome today two journalists with decades of experience with this complex, agonizing story around Afghanistan. Robin Wright of The New Yorker is an award-winning journalist and author who's reported from all over the world. Robin, of course, is also a proud University of Michigan alum and a former editor of the Michigan Daily. Joining Robin, we also have Jawad Sukanyar, an Afghan journalist and longtime reporter for the New York Times in his country. He's also a former Knight Wallace Fellow. He and his family evacuated after the fall of Kabul um, with help from the New York Times. He arrived back here in Ann Arbor in early October and has been invited to pursue research as a journalist in residence with our colleagues and co-sponsors for today's event, the Donia Human Rights Center. Um, we are hopeful that Jawad will be able to join us at the university once he has the permission of US immigration officials to do so. Um, Robin, Jawad, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be with you. And all I can say as a former sports editor at the Michigan Daily is go blue this Saturday. Go blue, thank you. Well, it's always good to start with a go blue. So Robin, I, I'd like to start with you because your voice is one that I have sought out um, regularly as this story unfolded over the summer, particularly in August. Um, and just for context, so that we can get everyone on the same page before we start talking, as we gather here today, we're taking stock of 20 years of a US exercise that ended with nearly 50,000 civilian deaths, tens of thousands of Afghans forced to flee their country because of their association with Western forces, Western media. Some 65,000 Afghans are expected to be resettled here in the United States over the next year with an estimated 30,000 more coming the following year. While back in Afghanistan, millions of Afghan citizens have been left scattered without resources. The UN estimates that more than 22 million Afghans could face severe hunger over the coming months. In a story that you wrote, Robin, that was published in the New Yorker on August 15th, uh, you wrote about what you called a quote, epic defeat. And I wanna just read um, a sentence from that story that you wrote. America's vast tools and tactics proved ill-equipped to counter the will and endurance of the Taliban and their Pakistani backers. In the long term, its missiles and warplanes were unable to vanquish a movement of 60,000 core fighters in a country about as big as Texas. An epic defeat. As you sit here now, we're at the end of October. How do you look back on that? assessment of mid-August, and where do you think we should be picking this up as a policy discussion now? 
Well, the policy decisions have been made uh, and I can, I'm happy with Jawad to go through where the final turning point was that led to the epic defeat of America's longest war. Uh, I don't, I, I won't change any of the things I wrote in August. I remain deeply concerned about the enduring impact, the impression that the withdrawal made, not just because of the evacuation that was chaotic, uh, swift, uh, tragic in the cost of lives, not just American lives, but in terms of uh, America standing in the world. I think there are a number of bottom lines. One, America is weakened in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of our allies. We mobilized 136 countries to provide some kind of aid or assistance in America's longest war. And we, we in the end, hurriedly walked away from it. Uh, we unilaterally decided its fate, even it, though we consulted sporadically with our allies. Secondly, jihadism won against democracy, which has, I think, long-term impact. We think that by eliminating Osama bin Laden of al-Qaeda or Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi of ISIS, that we have kind of won or made headway against jihadism. And the reality is the Taliban fought America's longest war, didn't have air power, didn't have armor, didn't have artillery, and yet they defeated the mightiest military in the world. Um, this is also, I think, a pattern that we can't look at uh, Afghanistan in isolation, that whether it's the, the US withdrawal from Vietnam in the 1970s, the hurried uh, withdrawal from Beirut by Marine peacekeepers in the 1980s, the withdrawal from Iraq in 2009 and now Afghanistan, the United States uh, has repeatedly been confronted by whether it's ragtag militias, insurgents that, who are poorly armed. Um, we outnumber and are out over equipped for these kinds of wars. And yet we have repeatedly opted to withdraw. So the, one of the questions is um, when and how should America intervene when there are injustices or security challenges? Because the one thing that Afghanistan and Iraq have proven more than anything else is that the United States does not know how to leave wars, does not know how to create new militaries, and finally uh, doesn't know how to help build nations. Yes. Jawad, this is an excellent place to bring you in. as. Robin was making those arguments the week end of August 15th, the weekend that Kabul fell. I was reading her work, but I was also on WhatsApp trying to check on your status and the safety of you and your family every few hours. Um, you had in the hours leading up to that Sunday that played out uh, on cable news channels around the world and in our, in our news media, you had, when you heard that, that the Taliban was, was entering Kabul, smashed all of your equipment, destroyed all of your records, anything that could have tied you to the Western um, press and with everyone were caught up in that scramble. And yet you knew, you knew that it was coming months before and so I think, you know, one of the struggles that people have had is this notion that the American narrative is no one saw this coming. Um, but in fact, a lot of people saw this coming over the months that led up to this. And, and Robin's point about America not knowing how to leave, how did you perceive all of that from the ground in Kabul? Thank you. Well, uh, as you put it, uh, most people who lived in Afghanistan, especially in the cities, uh, knew what was happening. But uh, because we had no choices at that time, it was just, you know, when you're waiting for a storm to hit you or hit your city or the town that you live, that's what people were doing. Uh, days and weeks before the collapse of Kabul and the Ghani uh, government, the conversations over dinner was all about 
who left the country, who is leaving, and, and, and where are uh, the places that we can leave. There was no hope and there was no, I mean, people were not expecting anything at that point from the Americans because they knew that all the doors were closed and it wasn't like the expectations that they had in the previous months and years that, you know, uh, America will be there, the West will be by the side of the Afghans and they will help Afghanistan stand on its feet and have a viable state and then government that can uh, run things and there is democracy, there is human rights. Uh, so all those models, all those promises that were given to us, uh, if you come into 2021, uh, the very last days, like in July and August, uh, before collapse of Kabul, uh, there were no words like that. It was all, you know, uh, a situation that people would thought America is abandoning us, and, and it's being repeated around Afghanistan the same way that other uh, powers had came to Afghanistan and left without asking the people and without caring about what, what what they had done and what was going to happen to the people who lived in that country. So, yeah, it was a moment of frustration and a moment of, you know, heartbreak, but it was happening and no one was listening to anyone. And uh, we, Afghan government, uh, was trying to reach out and, and make ways to see if they could find uh, a solution but it wasn't working out and it was too late for President Ghani and his team and, 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 and all Afghans. You would see Afghan women, prominent Afghan women, raise their voices, but wouldn't, no one would uh, listen to them. Uh, it didn't have that uh, things that were, that, were, that were there before. And it was very unfortunate. And the way it ended uh, was shocking and it was, yeah, it was too much for us. Robin, you talked about, you know, the first time you went to Afghanistan and you traveled through the Khyber Pass and there there were periods of optimism, right? That that there this conclusion that you've reached now wasn't always so or or was it? So, I've been in Afghanistan now in many phases. I first went there in the 1990s during the Taliban's first round of governing Afghanistan. And that's when I drove through the Khyber Pass and uh, to Kabul, a tortuous road at the time as Jawad knows well. Uh, and uh, I went. I was also on the first flight by then Secretary of State Colin Powell when he went in uh, after the fall of the Taliban. Um, and so there was that period when the United States had hopes that th that with the help of other Western nations, as well as with India, even Iran, the uh, other regional players, that, that they could build a different type of Afghanistan, provide education, um, develop a civil society, create an independent press. There was, you know, for a period of a very short period, uh, there was a sense of hope that that Afghanistan's long wars, you know, dating back um, decades, Soviet uh, invasion in 1979, but you know, Afghanistan has long been disputed by the great powers. It's the source of the great game in Asia. That there, you know, that there would be something different. So I saw that phase, and I saw. Uh, and I've gone back several times since with various secretaries of state and presidential visits and so forth. So I was there last in March this year when I returned with uh, General McKenzie, who is the leader of Central Command in charge of all the Middle East and all South Asia. And at that point, the Taliban had control of 50 percent of the country. And I interviewed the head of uh, the NATO forces, General Miller. And he was very candid. He said, "You know, this is a this is a tough slog, and the Taliban have made significant gains and are likely to continue to make gains." So, the I think the turning point that everyone needs to understand was the Doha Agreement last in February last year. And to preface this, I will say I'm not um, I don't cover politics in the United States. 
I say, frankly, a pox on all of their houses, but uh, uh, President Trump made a, what I think historians will look back on as a classic mistake, uh, sponsoring negotiations between the United States and the Taliban that did not include the government. Secondly, that decreed the United States was going to leave whatever happened and, and only hope that the Taliban and the government would be able to broker some kind of agreement and also put a date on it. So the minute there was a date uh, calling for a withdrawal at that point by May of this year, the Taliban very cleverly, which has fought the long war, gamed it far better than the United States, started going to the towns, villages, tribal elders, local councils and so forth and saying to all of them, you have a choice. You either side with us or you side with a corrupt government that's about to lose its American prop. And in the end, uh, the last 50% of the country was taken with very little fighting and Kabul mm -hmm. to the astonishment of everyone in Kabul, there was basically not a, a shot fired um, except perhaps in celebration. And, but the minute that Doha agreement was signed, the end was the writing was on the wall that the United States could not win militarily, that the Taliban could hold out longer. They, after all, are an indigenous force, and they know the country, they speak the language, and we have fought so many different types of war in Afghanistan. Never quite uh, knew what we what was the turning point that would allow us to leave, under what circumstances, what our end game was. 20 years and we never came up with the answers to those key questions. And that's about strategy or, or confusion of strategies that, that we'll come back to. But I, I want to come to Jawad um, because as a, as a journalist who's been covering this story and as an Afghan citizen, you've told me several times that you've never known your country at peace through your whole career. Uh, in your childhood before you even stumbled into being a journalist. Um, but at moments, you know, I asked Robin, there were moments of optimism, even in your coverage, you spent a lot of time writing about women's rights and, and education and leaders coming up and, and there were moments that it looked like part of the exercise were working, moving in the right direction. Where did you, do you also see that Doha moment as a moment when things began looking grim from your point of view? Exactly, yeah. The Doha deal that was signed in uh, February 2020, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was when the clock was about to turn in the Taliban's favor, and it was like a count, a moment of countdown. And it was at the time that the Afghan government could not do much. They were, however, they were trying to find ways to see if they could, in any way, uh, convince the US government and the international community to reconsider what was going to happen, but it didn't work because, you know, they also had internal issues, there were like political rift within the government, uh, there was a big opposition, the corruption was one issue, and uh, the insurgency, the Taliban were like stronger uh, than they were before. It was, it was a time that uh, most Afghans would, could say that things are not going on the right direction, especially. Did you, did you question during that time some of the the, the stories of the parts of the narrative that you had been reporting on over the years? Did you, did you question some of the things that, that you may have come to believe working for, working for the American press, working for the New York Times? Well, uh, we do, uh, we did ask questions, uh, but the thing is that it wasn't really on the Afghans and on those uh, people who were living there they couldn't uh, do much. They would say, well, um, America is leaving, but this is our country. We have our future tied to this country. We try our best to see if we could uh, ask what's uh, going to happen and, and, and prevent the Taliban from coming to power. 
uh, it wasn't as bad as uh, it just got in the recent weeks and months. Uh, I should say in 2020, the, we still had the Afghan government. Uh, there was the army. There was, you know, all government institutions. And for the Afghans, it was their country after all. They all had hope. Well, they wished that the work, especially America, would continue supporting at least, if not militarily, but politically and economically. If they stood by the side of the Afghan government, doesn't matter how how much they had, I mean, troubles uh, within the government itself. If uh, that support was there, I think, I think most Afghans were willing to stay and, and continue to do something that would uh, prevent what had happened recently. Uh, but it didn't work. And I should say that was one reason I returned to Afghanistan after I uh, completed my fellowship in Michigan. I already knew there was war going on, but since, you know, that was my country, Kabul was uh, relatively safe and it was my hometown. And I thought, well, uh, fleeing is not an option. Leaving the country uh, permanently is not an option. If I leave and others like me leave the country, who can we stay there? Mm. So we had our extended family, we had our, uh, our friends and the you know, people of Afghanistan, it, it's a strong attachment that's still here with me. And that's why uh, people who are there, uh, they still thought that the one, yeah, they, 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 would, they would believe that things wouldn't get the way it got later. But uh, it was all up to, you know, the international community's role and, and, and America on the lead. So, yeah. Yes. You, Robin, you wrote about, and you mentioned earlier, you know, that the, the, the conclusion was that the United States might have been successful in some ways at helping to forge a state, but, but that nation building is not something, that's something that we've proven over and over again that we cannot do. What what conclusions have you come to about our strategy or lack thereof? Well, I think Americans go in well-intentioned, but I think that we are, we have the luxury of being a big country where we don't have to learn other languages. Um, we live on a continent, a continent that is predominantly English speaking and uh, is culturally homogenous, even if we have our own differences. And we are so powerful as a nation, militarily, economically, but we really don't know much about the rest of the world, even about our allies, whether it's the French, we recently had and still have a, a serious crisis with the French government, which is our oldest ally. Uh, and But when it comes to a country like Afghanistan, where we have no history, where, uh, where Afghans assimilate into American culture. We don't absorb them, their ways, their language, their traditions in ours. And so we go into these places knowing little, having little experience. We think we're gonna get rid of the bad guys. Um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq or the Taliban leadership in Afghanistan. And then we really don't know what to do. And we invest a lot. The United States spent $83 billion just training the Afghan military, which was four times larger than the Taliban military. Um, we spent well over a trillion dollars. I mean, there are a lot of Americans who are resentful because we spent so much when our own infrastructure is so horrible, where we have, you know, poverty problems uh, that are, you know, that have increased, particularly the pandemic, and there, and and yet we have nothing, literally nothing, to show for it. We we, you know, the NGOs, particularly like American University in Kabul, um, uh, we helped with the education process. We helped uh, train whether it was the independent press. We we hired a lot of people, and in the process, whether in government, non-government organizations. Uh, created a different vision. 
The tragedy of Afghanistan is so many of those people, including Jawada, are now out of the country. Yes. And they are not there to, you know, push for women's rights uh, and to challenge the Taliban in the media. Uh, the penalties are too high, frankly, and I'd, if I were an Afghan, I would have wanted out too. But the problem is all we invested, we, you know, they've now left, whether they're in Sweden, the United States, uh, Pakistan, Iran, but so many of those who are well-trained are now out. And it should be said, you know, that, that, that many waited until the very last minute. I think, you know, as we have so many Afghans soon settling in cities across the United States, there may be some assumption that, you know, they, they wanted to be here. Um, and Jawad, we've talked a lot about the fact that no, most people did not w want this to be the end for them. They did not want to end up in the United States. They wanted, like you, to be building their country. And and so, what do you, what do you do when the journalists and the artists and the scholars and the activists um, and the people fighting for human rights have been forced to flee? Well, it's hard to uh, to believe what happened here, and as, as you put it, uh, all those people who are needed there, uh, educated people, uh, journalists, artists, musicians, this is the product of the 20 years of US presence in Afghanistan, the international community's presence, and you take all these, and, but you still see there is a country with millions of people uh, trapped and the Taliban are in the, uh, ruling. Uh, they have turned the country into like a mass prison. Uh, there is a problem of you know economic collapse. There is drought. There is uh, the pandemic, and there is this, uh, you know. Imagine what's going to happen to a mother, to a sister, to a, to a woman who lives in a village. Uh, what she what is she going to think what had happened that all everything got uh in this way and and, and she's not receiving the basic health services that she used to like a month ago uh, i think the international community and the us uh, they all have a moral obligation to look at the humanitarian aspect of what's going to happen in afghanistan we hear stories of individuals and people being at great risk and, and, and great danger. And uh, beside that, they're, they're having trouble and getting by. They, their sources of income is no more there. They have a hard time like finding food on their table. And it, it's, it's something that makes us worry. Uh, yeah. We thank the international community for what they have been doing in Afghanistan in the past 20 years, but the way it ended, this is something that Afghans wouldn't expect this to happen. Uh, they have opened, uh, you know, their presence, they are opened uh, windows of opportunity for people like myself to get education and to be able to work for uh, international news media. Uh, but then, you know, we had a longer dream than what had happened here. We wanted to, you know, continue living there and, and using uh, and applying what we have learned and experienced to our country for the good of all people. And, you know, there is a community is still in need of help. Uh, we know uh, what's going on there and it, it's hard to, yeah. Yeah, you know. a, moral, a moral obligation and also still a strategic obligation, I would, I would think. I mean, that that you mentioned the the mother sister daughter left in a village somewhere whose life just became who, whose circumstances have just become very dire uh who gets blamed for that um certainly the 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 chaotic disgraceful ex exit there's some there's some leftover <laughs> There's there are residual effects of that, and what does that mean strategically um, for America's 
position in, in Afghanistan and the world. Robin, do you, what do you, you know, how do we balance the moral obligation and our strategic obligation, strategic interests? I can't say enough about the moral obligation the United States has. And the, you know, Americans wanted out of Afghanistan, just like they wanted out of Iraq. And the problem is we turn our back when we leave. And let me just illustrate that whether it's American forces who fought there, the United States uh, it's going to take another $2 trillion just to deal uh, between now and 2050 with the disability and the benefits mm -hmm. that we owe our troops. That's another $2 trillion that we haven't spent. Then there is the terrible situation we've left behind in Afghanistan. And there are big questions about should the United States provide aid through international agencies, not through the Taliban, to those who are starving, uh, should we provide vaccines to those so that uh, they don't uh, they don't die? So we provide money through educational institutions. You know what kind of aid should we give? And of course, Americans' appetite is when we want out of something, we want out. And yes. then there's the bigger question, the big question too, the, at a third layer, and that is the people like Jawad and the tens of thousands who are either here or who are coming here. Um, I know the officials at the State Department who are in charge of this challenge, and there are thousands and thousands dispersed at U.S. military bases, and the U.S. can't provide jobs, can't provide housing, can't provide the means, you know, have to try to figure out what to do in terms of education. And the U.S. is relying on whether it's Lutheran services or, you know, Catholic charities um, or there's Jewish family program. services here in Washtenaw County. Yeah, so there is, there's a new program that the government announced this week that any five people can band together and come up with, I think it's $2,700 to sponsor you know, a family, but that's just basics. And the logistics of all of this is a nightmare. I have a lawyer friend in Washington who's been trying to get, who knows a family and has been, went out and bought diapers and toys and clothing because many of these people left with nothing but the backpacks or what they, they could literally physically carry and especially at the end, and they have nothing, nothing. And trying to find ways to bring these people into society. And the great fear, my great fear, is that we don't have the moral conscience. We did when we were affected after 9-11 and we were gonna you know, get our revenge and uh, go in and eliminate the bad guys, but we have no moral sense of helping those who, you know, people who helped us all those, de you know, those two decades. And it just breaks my heart. Really, and I think that we don't realize how the Afghan war, we may have ended it, but it's far from over. It is far from over. And I'm so glad that you raised these points. And it's why it's so meaningful to have you here with Jawad today, because it's one thing to read these facts in a newspaper. It's another thing to have the opportunity to have someone like Jawad here in our university community, in our Ann Arbor community in Southeast Michigan, because I can tell you just what you said. In the end, Jawad left with a backpack, yeah. his family that included four children uh, and their passports and, and nothing else um, after all of those years of working for the US media. And, um, you know, I think it's important to be able to, to have the Afghans who are arriving in this country to engage with our communities so that people can meet, meet people like Jawad in person. Maybe that helps to reinforce this sense of moral obligation, uh, Robin, that, that you spoke so eloquently about, that we simply cannot just walk away from this obligation. It's, Jawad, I don't know how you respond to just hear, even hearing Robin talk about that leaving, the exit and the, and the uh, trauma. I mean, there's no other way to call it, the, tra the trauma of that, of that exit and your having to flee um, and end up here. Exactly. Yeah, Robin put it in the right way, and uh, yeah, and it has been it has been even too hard, too difficult for us as Afghans who were there, and we we were just you know, 
uh, we didn't know what's going to happen. It was it was a situation that we we thought like I thought, well, I'm stranded and there is no hope and and, and they're 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 about to abandon this country and we're being, you know, betrayed and 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 it's, it was a sense of uh, yeah, it was hard to believe what was going on, and uh, yeah. Uh, I came into a group of people that uh, since I worked for the media, we were not in any group to be prepared to leave the country up until you know the last month of the withdrawal. Uh, you know, it was in I don't know May or June that I found out that well we are, we come uh, we have been working for the Americans and now they're they're evacuating and then trying to help SIVs. SIV applicants to leave, we have been helping them too, and we have been working alongside them too. Which is our, uh, uh, where is the program for us, and from which category we come under? Uh, that was the time that we found out that, well, yeah, the sense of having hope for this country was, you know, it was in, in question. Uh, we thought that things are not, yeah, the way they should have been and i was just debating with myself well if i leave this country how could i help my extended family and and what happens to our home or what happens to our identity and, and what's uh, that we can do uh, if we are not here but it just yeah it just happened as as i would say this it was it was a storm coming our way and we were trying to hold ourselves, ourselves strong and, and and be able to manage. And yeah, the final days were, were like too much. Already you would see people on the streets of Kabul being desperately looking for homes. These, these are the IDPs who already fled uh, provincial capitals as the Taliban were advancing into like the central Afghanistan and the, the towards Kabul, uh, you would see like parks and, uh, and roads, like roadsides being occupied by these IDPs having almost nothing. And then people in Kabul were trying to see what they could do. Like, uh, uh, but just, we were like, we were, we were in the line and it just came yes. all the way to Kabul and uh, the, the, the day that, Kabul collapsed. It was. It was, it was a, nightmarish. It was nightmarish uh, having you recount, and having to wonder every few hours if you were still safe, if you were able to get to the airport. Um, I want to make time for questions and remind people that you can put your questions into the chat, either on Facebook or um, or on YouTube. And uh, also you can tweet, somebody is monitoring Twitter. And uh, so you can um, tweet using the hashtag policy talks and we'll be looking for those questions. And before we, before we take our first question, um, I do want to try to turn this you know, forward looking to, to not a, with a sense of naivete, but, but but if we are to advance with some sense of of of, of, of moral um, of moral obligation of strategic sense, are there things, Robin, that that we should be doing, could be doing now to to both do right by the people who've been affected? in um by this exit but also think about our our america's strategic position and how to um if not recover at least gain some balance now in the world so uh, the one thing that struck me about jawad's moving description of the final days was the one was the word betrayal and that's what this is this is the great betrayal and so in trying to figure out what we do next, I think the big question is, uh, how do we do something that doesn't betray the future? 
for that country, for our reputation, uh, for a sense of order in the world. We violated the basic rules of order in just deciding we'd leave. And that's not to say that that staying even with a small presence would have prevented what happened. The US military acknowledged in the congressional debate yes. that, that it would the same thing would have happened either way. So, uh, so in terms of charting a future, there are not a lot of good options. And, and that's particularly true because the United States is trying to pivot in the 21st century to China. It's something the last four presidents have tried to do. Really, five presidents, can, if you look at the kind of post-Cold War era, and we haven't done it with very much success because we keep being sucked into the conflicts, whether it's in the Middle East or South Asia. And we still have some big questions that have to do with Iran, which borders Afghanistan. Pakistan borders Afghanistan. It has nuclear weapons and has, you know, has had sporadic tensions with India, sporadic wars with India. But there are still a lot of issues. And the question is, where do we invest our resources? And we tend to be a one issue at a time nation. We can take whether it's the Soviet Union during the Cold War, Vietnam during the Vietnam War. A lot of the wars we, we that I spent uh, almost half of my life covering were as a result of they were proxy wars between Washington and Moscow. Now we're kind of doing beginning to do that on an economic sphere with China. Um, it's but still dealing with the old issues of you know who's got more bombs or who has more troops. So it's you know there are not a lot of obvious or appealing solutions in helping Afghanistan. The US envoy who negotiated the Doha agreement, a controversial figure, an American actually born in Kabul, named Zalme Khalilazad, did a briefing this morning in Washington. And his argument is that um, the United States should be talking to the Taliban. Well, this is a this is a group that's on our terrorism list and that you know um, you can make an argument both ways. Uh, do we and we are talking with them. We're talking to them through Doha. We're talking to them through intelligence sources. We're talk, talking to them through third parties. But will we offer them the recognition? You know, I think that's going to be a very hard question. Um, and I think that that the United States right now, given the American mood, the American appetite, the American kind of the polls indicating that Americans are not so interested in foreign policy right now. It's 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 not naive to, to say what good can we do. I think it's the, the problem is there's not much we can do on any front, not just yeah. in Afghanistan. No. Jawad, there's I'm gonna we we've got some questions from um, our audiences on various platforms and I, I wanna pose this first one to you. What kind of role do you think journalists or media institutions here in the U.S. can play or should play to better serve people who have fled, like yourself, um, or who remain in Afghanistan or support the kind of future that you would like to see? Is there a role for for the U.S. media who had a, ro a role in in our presence in Afghanistan to play now? Sure, they can play a very positive role in helping out raise like awareness about people who are getting moved from Afghanistan to uh, the United States. They can raise their voices and, 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 and let the American people know who these people are who were being evacuated uh, and uh, this is very important it, there is a cultural difference uh, afghans who left their homes you know the way of life in afghanistan i'm sure everyone knows that the way people dress people uh, eat food and, and, and interact uh, it, it's different and this is something that the media can play a role here by both educating that those who just got here and, and Americans, as well as about who these people are, what they had been doing, and why are they here, uh, and what they can do to help them. Like, you know, there is a need for like uh, a get together of this these people within uh, 
the American community, there has to be like a bridge built into this relation. So I feel there is so much that the media can do uh, to play a positive role in that, as well as uh, there is still room for like advocacy for, for Afghans who are, who are in Afghanistan and they need humanitarian support. Uh, uh, let's not forget them. And it's the media that can play a vital role here by like continuing to continuing to cover the continuing to cover the country and continuing to like inform people that well uh, it's the end of the American president pre uh, presence in Afghanistan, but then there is there is a country and there is this population they need attention and they need support and as human beings yeah. There are moral obligations and responsibilities. Um, Robin, this next question I'll pose to you. You you alluded to it in an earlier response, but but um, one of our viewers asks: Would there have been a more efficient way to withdraw? Um, would the Afghans experience the same degree of oppression if we had withdrawn, but somehow done it differently? Was there a better way to do this? So there were a couple of different issues here. And one is the fact that uh, uh, Jawad probably has a special immigrant visa. Uh, anyway, a lot of Afghans have special immigrant visas to allow them to come to the United States. And the Trump administration did not uh, start giving them. There was kind of a freeze on it for a very long time. And so the Biden administration came in. And again, I'm not getting political here. But the Biden administration came in and, um, you know, there was an overwhelming backlog and nobody handled it very well. So there was a question of those who might have wanted to leave. Then I think there were, you know, there were questions about the Afghans. Everyone hoped that, you know, the Taliban would be held back. The, and especially that the Afghan army, which is what we haven't talked about, would not just simply put out their put down their arms and flee. I mean, since it was four times larger than the Taliban force, there were hopes that at least Kabul and some of the urban centers might have been protected from the Taliban. Um, and then there's the third question: Would a minimal number of American troops, 2,500, down from you know more than 100,000 at the peak, would that have been enough? As it has been in Iraq, in dealing with ISIS, for example. Uh, we still have a presence in Japan and Germany all these decades after the end of World War II. Would that have been enough just psychologically as a prop to keep the Afghan army from taking off their uniforms, dropping their weapons and fleeing into the, you know, into the countryside or cross borders or to their kind of rural homes? Um, and, and so, you know, we don't, those are all hypotheticals we don't know. If there had been a more efficient means of dealing with visas so there wasn't this huge scramble. Um, the, the one issue was that the minute that the Biden administration decided, yes, we will observe uh, what was agreed on in the Doha agreement. They Remember, Biden extended it from May 1st to the end of August, so there was that window. But the minute that Biden said yes, the US military knew that if Stayed, it was going to come under uh, more pressure from the Taliban. Uh, it would lose territory faster. And so they did had to get out fast to ensure that there wasn't more loss of American life. And so they had to, and it turned out that they had to do everything very quickly. And so the United States went from a smaller force. We had just over 2,500 there. And we had to go to 6,000 just to evacuate. Um, one of the moving stories I wrote about was the last American to die in active combat uh, died in 2017 on his ninth tour in Afghanistan. Yes. And um, his wife, whom he met in the special forces, who had, when she was deployed in Afghanistan, was dispatched back to Afghanistan to help the evacuation. So, you know, was there a more efficient way? Uh, once the decision was made, the problem was you had to get a lot of equipment out or destroy the equipment. You had to get the Americans out, it was just a huge log logistical operation. And the US military, strategy aside of the war or politics aside by, you know, from either administration, 
did an amazing job in getting that many. And I think Jawad would, would tell you that they did an amazing job in getting that many people out. Didn't get everybody out for sure. Um, still, there's the United States is still working today to get Americans out. Uh, Americans and people who helped the United States during our 20 year presence. Um, but were there, you know, was there a better way around it? When the decision was made by both presidents to get out, there were few alternatives. Yes. And I, I, I would like to just, on one point you made about the special immigrant visas, because I do think that there's an assumption in the United States that most of the people who are coming on special are on special immigrant visas. And I, my understanding is that they're reserved for a relatively small um, group of people who work directly with the U.S. military. In fact, most of the people coming in now, like Jawad, um, who came in in a rather chaotic fashion um, are on humanitarian parole. And uh, humanitarian parole does not carry with it the same immigration status. It's a, it, it requires um, an employment authorization document. The reason I said at the beginning, we hope that Jawad will be able to join us at the university is because once he got that humanitarian parole stamp, um, which we're grateful, of course, that he received, he has to, everyone who has that status has to next receive uh, an employee employment authorization document, an EAD, to be able to work or, or receive any sort of compensation for anything in the United States. And, and this rush of people, the process has not quite caught up to the thousands of people um, who have entered the country. And so one of the things we hope can happen is that is that the the path forward um, can be made clear for these tens of thousands of people who find themselves here um, in a in a non planned fashion? Can, um, can I just point out that many of them are living in tents on army bases? Yes, but, you know this is not they're not put in houses and you know with active toilets and running water and yeah. so forth. They're they're it's really a makeshift existence. And this is we're going into winter. This is a very tough time and. You know, the one thing Americans can do is um, is offer help. Yes, yes, and and push for offer help at the community level, but then off also push for and advocate for um, the kind of clarity and immigration status that would allow the people who really would like to move forward um, with their lives to to do so. Um, Jawad, there, there's a question for you here because I mentioned that you wrote on women's rights when you came here as a Knight Wallace fellow, you were studying women's rights movements and someone asks, um, can you share what you learned as a journalist reporting on women's rights in Afghanistan? And, um, and are there women or girls that you find yourself thinking of now? Um, that you've written about over the past several years and, and what their fate might be now? Sure, yeah. Uh, working for the New York Times, my area of work was especially working on stories about women and, you know, Afghanistan as a country where uh, women are like, uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about before the Taliban, Especially in rural Afghanistan, women are unfortunately not treated well, and sometimes there are stories that that's like you know makes you think about, and, and these stories are really sad stories. Uh, we have been following those stories and writing about uh, stories uh, like ill treatment of women, forced marriages, child marriages, and, and as well as women who did well. Uh, and, and in education, in politics, and, and uh, who have achieved a lot and, and even got awards, uh, international awards. So these were the stories we were following and, and, and writing about. And there are stories mostly about ill treatment of girls and, and, and newly married women. And, and there are few. Uh, Stories of gang rapes, which I'm uh, which is unfortunate, but uh, those were the stories we were covering, and, and I, I feel great uh, for doing those. And 
being able to write about women uh, is something yeah that makes me feel proud and uh, i think they really deserve uh, attention but i know that jawad it also brings some level of um uh, torment too i know in those days around the exit you would be getting messages from sources and women who were trying to get out or wanting to know if you if you had any suggestions any solutions there were everybody was receiving these frantic messages and um you yeah know, you, you remain in touch with a lot of the people I, who you've written about i'm still in touch with them there were a few prominent women uh leaders i should say who led the organizations which were taking care of women and working for women's rights and uh, we have worked closely with them these are uh, lawyers and, and, and uh, women's rights activists and uh, I, ha I'm, I had good connections with them and they would uh, help uh, tip uh, on, on stories that we would do and we would write about those stories and we had like close connections and uh, this was on until what happened recently and a few of those women uh, started reaching me out via WhatsApp and uh, 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 Messenger and trying to ask for help uh, for them uh, it was uh, it was hard you know it was hard to get out and being women and being like in a position of a leadership for example there are organizations like uh, Afghan for Afghan women uh, that's based in the U.S. but has its branches in Afghanistan serving uh, women, uh, victims of vi domestic violence. And, and, and those women who lead those organizations, uh, they really need help. And, and those were the people who would uh, reach out. I don't want to name anyone, but yes. yeah, I was getting voice, uh, voice messages, uh, which was really hard to, yeah. You know, we have to we have to wrap up. Um, but I I think there there have been several questions um, that lead to a last question. You know, Robin, you you mentioned in a couple of different ways our short attention span um, for stories, our ability to keep one thing front and center, more than one thing front and center at any given time. For both of you, as a final thought, what can Americans do to keep this story front and center and what should we be this is a policy talk what what should we be pushing for that might make some change or, or some um, morally acceptable outcomes from uh, from this amoral uh, betrayal or exit from Afghanistan. I'll say something particularly for your Wallace students, and that is that uh, in a capitalist society, the media is uh, beholden to viewers and readers. Um, we have to give people what they want to read about even more than what they need to write about, read about, uh, which is why People Magazine gets more readership than The Economist why USA Today gets more readership probably than the New York Times, or maybe it's up there in the same category, but they're very different kinds of publications. That as much as we want to write, whether it's in editorials or stories about what's happening, um, we have, you know, journal, media outlets have to survive economically too. And so it takes a lot, it takes, you know, the kind of intervention. And our role as journalists is not always to intervene. We're supposed to, we get assigned to what a story is. And so, you know, there are lots, I spent seven years in Africa and there's not much coverage of Africa right now. Um, when there was a black, white issue, you know, it was something that, that resonated in the United States and that's not as true anymore. And there are, so there are a lot of things important happening on that continent as well. So, uh, you know, I, I would love to say that there's a solution, you know, write your guts out, uh, draw attention, but there are also space limitations, you know, and, and media outlets have smaller and smaller space and smaller, fewer and fewer editors and reporters. 
So it's a real challenge. How do we draw attention to the things we need to? There are a lot of stories we've walked away from in the past that deserve attention too, and they're not getting it today. And that's the reality. Mm -hmm. Jawad, what if you can think about what Americans could do to help people like you who suddenly find themselves here um, in the United States and also the people who are not here, who are back in Afghanistan, um, facing a, a pretty grim situation right now, what would you, what are some things that people could do? Well, now that I'm here, we're here, uh, the only thing we need is that, you know, we need help and finding our ways from here on. Uh, we need help on that. We're to take our career from, from here what to do next we need help with resettlement and we need like you know our families need help our kids need to be at school and be able to continue studying here and uh, yeah that's what we need and, and on our immigration status and process uh, needs to be cleared uh, like right now it's a little bit hard for me to understand what's going to happen to me after this parole is over, uh, which category I come under, what's going to happen to uh, my immigration status, whether I will be uh, still, uh, whether I will be expecting a, a PR, a permanent uh, residency card or a green card, which I, I mean, I don't know. These are the things that are not clear to, to add. In some ways, the, the things that are you're articulating are things that people would want anywhere, right? Clarity, yeah. a safe place to live, um, a path for their families to be fed and, and housed and their children in school and clarity about what opportunities they have for their lives. And so I think that's a, as good a point as any to end this on. Um, and that to... to to thank our um, the people who've joined us across all of the platforms uh, today in sharing in this conversation. And Robin and Jawad, thank you for helping us, at least for this hour, keep the story front and center and to encourage people to follow it and raise their voices. Um, and I want to thank the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy for convening these policy talks and for including Wallace House and journalism in these talks and for the Donia Human Rights Center here at the University of Michigan, um, who is waiting to work with Jawad when it becomes possible. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good luck, Jawad. Good luck, Robin. Thanks for sharing this platform.